Good morning. I'm so pleased to be with you and to be able to talk with you this morning about some things that are really important to me and that I hope that you'll see are very important to you. But I've been told I'm supposed to start by trying to answer a question that was raised, was it last week? Last week, yeah, okay. And the question is, historians can't find evidence of Moses or Joseph's existence in history. The scholarly consensus is that they are myths. Do we flatly reject their findings? I think we have to realize that what historians and archaeologists can find is limited by resources. That is, you couldn't find evidence of Moses or Joseph if such records were not kept. And we can't assume that they kept those kinds of records. Our evidence of the past is spotty the further we get back. And the fact that no Egyptian records have identified Moses is no surprise. Egyptians didn't try to write down everything. They only wrote down the things that showed what a great king Pharaoh was. Obviously, the Moses story didn't show that. They'd have no reason to preserve it. So the fact that we don't have those pieces of evidence from the ancient world just indicates the spottiness of our evidence and the nature of things that people in the ancient world wrote down. So I don't think we have to give in to the uh, skeptics of today and think that somehow our Bibles are undermined by those kinds of observations. Hope that helps. Well, let's move on to what we're going to talk about today. I've got some questions. Maybe there are questions you've thought about. Why did God create us? What's the Bible all about? What is it that God has always wanted? Big questions. But we're going to take a shot at them. We're going to go from Genesis to Revelation. Hope you brought a lunch. And we're going to try to understand what the Bible has to tell us about those things. Now, I call this an Emmanuel theology, and you'll find out why as we go along. So keep that in the back of your mind as we start to talk about these things. Now, of course, we need to begin in Genesis chapter 1. Where else? And there's a lot we could talk about there, but we're not going to. Genesis 1 talks about God's creating, his ordering the world with a purpose. And sometimes we read it and we don't quite see what the purpose is. In fact, we get to day 7 and we're utterly confused. God rested? Was that his purpose? Does God need rest? Does he need downtime? Does he get exhausted from his work? And of course, no, 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 no. So what's this all about? And what does it have to do with creation? And so we end up kind of, well, I don't know. Must be something to do with the Jewish ritual. And on we go. And when we do that, we have missed the most important point of the creation narrative. Because there's something that as moderns we don't know that everybody in the ancient world knew very well. And that is, when a god rests, he rests in a temple. That's what temples were built for. And when God rests in a temple, he doesn't rest in a bed. He doesn't rest in a recliner. When God rests in a temple, he rests on a throne. God's rest is God's rule. And God has ordered the cosmos in order to rule it. And that's what he does on day seven. You can see that if we leave day seven out, we've missed the most important part. Because it's not just about God ordering the world, just creating it. It's about what he's going to do with it. He's ruling it. Now, we've missed that in chapter 1. We shouldn't have. 
It's not just because we haven't known about the ancient Near East. It's because sometimes perhaps we haven't read the Bible carefully enough. If we look in Psalm 132, 14, God's talking about the temple. And he says, this is my resting place. So you can see temple and resting place brought together. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned. Enthroned. That's what God does when he rests. That's different. That's important. We can see that that last line in that psalm expresses the next important step. For I have desired it. I propose then that God created us in order to be with us, to dwell among us. He created us with the idea that his presence would be among us and that that is something that he has desired. I would be so bold to say that is what God has always wanted since that's what he set up. And so Genesis 1, the creation narrative ends with God having ordered the world for his presence. Chapter 2, the story of the Garden of Eden, tells us that that's exactly what happened. It's there that God is residing. God is dwelling with Adam and Eve in relationship with them. Presence and relationship go together. Sometimes we think of the Garden of Eden and all we can think about is what a nice green space it is. What a nice park. Wouldn't it be nice to stroll there on a Sunday afternoon and have a picnic there on the grounds and enjoy the nature? That is not what the Garden of Eden is about. The Garden of Eden is not just green space. It's sacred space. And it's sacred because God is there. And when God's somewhere, you're on holy ground. Remember Moses, the burning bush, shoes off, you're on holy ground. And so the Garden of Eden is sacred space. And again, from the ancient world, we know that when they built temples, they typically built these kinds of gardens next to them as part of the sacred space of God's presence. And so in the Garden of Eden, there it is. God is doing what he intended to do, dwelling among his people in relationship with them. Genesis 3. Things go bad. We often talk about their disobedience. And of course it is disobedience. They were told not to eat it, and they did. So it's disobedience, it's eating fruit that they were told not to eat, but that's not the big deal. The big deal is that that is a wisdom fruit, and they were taking wisdom for themselves, and wisdom has the objective of finding order, and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, because in God you find order, but Adam and Eve wanted to seize wisdom and order for themselves. Some of you are parents and you're used to hearing, I want to do it myself. I can do it myself. And we never grow out of that, I want to do it my way. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They asserted their own desire for that wisdom that would let them order their own world around themselves. And that's what we continue to do as human beings, to try to order our world around ourselves. And God said, not in my garden, you don't. And out they went. Go ahead. You want to order it around yourselves? Good luck with that. Hope it goes well. We often refer to this as the fall The Bible never calls it that. Old or New Testament never calls it that. We think about it theologically as a fall from grace. And that's okay, but I think there's a more important aspect there. 
And so rather than calling it the fall, I would prefer to call it the loss. Because the most important thing that happened was they lost access to God's presence. Remember, God sets up a guardian at the entrance to the garden to block the way to the tree of life, to block the way to God's presence. And so in chapter 3, the loss. What God had planned from eternity past to dwell among his people, lost. Genesis chapter 4, are you starting to get worried? How many chapters are there in the Bible? Anyway, Genesis chapter 4, we see that in the time of Seth, it tells us in 426, in the time of Seth, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And we read right by that, we just think, oh, okay, they were praying, cool, okay? But no, that, that particular phrase has a more specific meaning. When they call on the name of the Lord, they are calling for the name of the Lord to be established among them. They are invoking the presence of God. They want it back, no surprise. And so we find that as we go through these initial chapters of Genesis, the concept of God's presence is at the core of what is happening. The broken relationship, the lost presence is, <coughs> is what the problem is. Okay, let's skip some. All the way to chapter 11. So in Genesis chapter 11, Tower of Babel. It's kind of a familiar story, but again, it's one that we easily get wrong. And we get it wrong because we don't know what those towers are. Because that information was kind of lost to us. But archaeologists now can tell us an awful lot about those towers. Some towers have been excavated. Some, uh, we find out a lot about them in literature from the ancient world, the building of them, uh, the, the importance of them, the significance that they have, and we find out a lot about them. And they're called ziggurats. And ziggurats look a little like pyramids, but they're not like pyramids at all. A pyramid's important for what's inside it. Chambers, burial things, all of that. Treasures, pathways, all inside. Ziggurat, nothing is inside. They built the frame, they filled it in with rubble. There's nothing inside. What you see is what you get, and that is stairways and ramps. What are they doing? Well, we read the passage from our own modern perspectives, and we say, well, it says that they were trying to make a name for themselves. And so that, we conclude, represents pride, and therefore we assume they're trying to get up to heaven. They're building a tower so they can get up to heaven to do who knows what. Different people had different suggestions, but we've kind of read the passage that way. Once we learn that this is a ziggurat, we have totally different information available to us because ziggurats were not built for people to go up. Ziggurats were built for God to come down. Pieces coming together... We didn't know what day seven was about, and we didn't know what Garden of Eden was, and we didn't know what was happening at the fall. But now we see that these all have to do with the presence of God, and chapter 11 is the bookend with Genesis 1 through 3 that pulls this whole section together. They were trying to recover God's presence. Let's build a stairway that reaches all the way up to God so that God can come down. Now, what we learn about the ziggurats also is that the ziggurats were not just something by themselves. They were built as part of the temple complex. And the idea was that the God would come down the ziggurat and enter into the temple complex and be worshipped. So it's part of sacred space. People would not go on the ziggurat. Just like an Israelite wouldn't decide to go into the Holy of Holies to have his morning quiet time. You don't go there. Okay, ziggurats were sacred space for the God's use only. The executive elevator. No, never mind. Okay, get the idea? Now we'd say, so what's wrong with that? I mean, if they wanted God back and they were going to all this effort and trouble to do it, what's wrong with that? Their motive was what was wrong with it. And that's where we get back to that line 
They wanted to make a name for themselves. Now again, we've thought of that as pride. But when you look at the use of that phrase in the Bible, in the ancient world, we find out that making a name is something that most everybody wants to do and there's nothing inherently wrong with it. You make a name by doing great deeds, heroic deeds. You make a name by being a just king, a compassionate king. You make a name by being a good father, a faithful mother. You make a name for yourself by anything that you do that will cause you to be remembered when you're gone. That's making a name. Now, you could do it by doing bad things, being a tyrant or a conqueror or something of that sort, but it's not inherently a bad thing. Most people in the ancient world made a name for themselves by having children because your descendants would remember you when you're gone. So wanting to make a name is not a bad thing, and it's not done necessarily by bad ways. So what's the problem here? Well, another piece from the ancient Near East that we don't readily know in our day. All the religions of the ancient Near East, except Israel, all the religions of the ancient Near East were based on something that I call the great symbiosis. Let me explain it. They believed that the gods had existed for long ages and that the gods had needs. So the gods needed food, so they had to grow their own food. And the gods needed housing, so they had to build their own houses. And the gods had to kind of do for themselves, make their own clothes, because the gods had needs. And, of course, they were gods, so they got tired of that. They didn't want to do for themselves so much. And one day, a great idea somebody has, you know, we could, we're gods, we could create slave labor. We could make people to do for us, to do all the things we need. And so they create people. And the idea was that the people then would feed them sacrifices. The people would house them, temples. The people would clothe them and pamper them, make glorious images of them, and that would be wonderful. People would take care of them. But of course, that had the opposite side of the coin. If people were going to be able to take care of the gods, well, the gods had to somehow take care of the people. They had to send rain so the people could grow food, so the people could feed the gods. They had to protect them from enemies and from disease and all of those things because if the people die off or get killed, then they can't take care of the gods. And so there's this idea of this great symbiotic relationship. People take care of the gods. The gods take care of people. A relationship of mutual dependence. And the idea was then that if the people really went to great effort and extent to take care of the gods, then the gods would really, really, really be happy about that, and they would bring blessing and prosperity to the people. Now, with that information, you can now make sense of the people building a tower to make a name for themselves. They want God to come down. They want God to enter the temple. They want God to receive all of their lavish, ex exuberant worship because then the God will take care of them and they will be successful. They will be prosperous. They will have the God's favor and the God will give them all kinds of great things and their name will be great. Most of the religions through the history of the world have thought that way. What do you have to do to get the God's favor so that he will enhance your life? So that he will make you successful and prosperous? So that he will give you anything that you want? What does it take? Many of the religions of the ancient world are based on that premise. Of course, not Christianity. It, oh, wait. Do we sometimes get caught in that trap? That somehow it's all about us and what God's going to do for us? Do we sometimes get thinking that God has needs that we somehow meet? Guilty as charged, right? Even Christians can slip into that kind of thinking. But that's the great symbiosis thinking. You do for God, and God does for you. 
The Babel builders, the tower builders, wanted to bring God down so they would enter his temple. They made a glorious image of him, we presume. It doesn't talk about it, but so that he could be worshipped, so that they could meet his needs. It's always great to have a God in your pocket, to have a God who's at your beck and call, to a God who's addressing your every whim. And that's what they wanted. But they wanted it to make their name great, because that's the result they saw. That's the agenda that they had, to make their name great. But if you're building sacred space, if you want God's presence among you, it's got to be about his name. It can't be about your name. It's about him, not about us. And so it's interesting, we miss this usually when we read chapter 11 of Genesis. God came down. That's what they built it for. And God came down, looked around, not a chance. And he is not going to establish his presence under those circumstances. Wrong motives, not going to happen. So Genesis 1 through 11 is framed by this idea of God's presence and trying to get it back, having lost it, trying to get it back. And the whole rest of the Bible is the story about how God is going to reestablish his presence on earth. And I'm going to take you through it. Because that's what the Bible's all about. We often even get confused when we see chapter 11 branching into chapter 12, which is now about Abraham and the covenant. And we say, whoa, what's going on? How does 1 through 11 have to do with Abraham and the covenant? Everything. The Tower of Babel was human initiative rejected by God. The covenant is God's counter initiative. Because through the covenant, God is going to reestablish his presence on earth. God tells Abraham that through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's because God is going to return to earth through Abraham and his family. He's going to dwell among the Israelites. And the covenant is already setting up a relationship that's going to drive us to God's presence being reestablished. Now, we often don't read the covenant that way. We somehow think it's just about God making promises or, oh, God's going to save us someday. No, there's something much more important going on here. Take a look at it in Leviticus 26, 11 and 12. I will put my dwelling place among you. That's the tabernacle. I will not abhor you. That's the loss. I will walk among you. That's presence. And be your God, and you will be my people. That's relationship. Many of you haven't run into this verse because when you're reading through Leviticus, you don't get this far before you give up. It's a tough book. I get it. I get that. Okay? But here it is. This is what the covenant's all about. And when we see the Israelites arrive at Mount Sinai after leaving Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea, and there they are at Mount Sinai, and we think that the big show is the Ten Commandments. God booming with a voice from the mountain and the tablet written with stone. And we think that it's all about the Ten Commandments. It's not. The Ten Commandments covers half a chapter. Half the book of Exodus is about the instructions for the tabernacle, which I know you read it and it bores you to tears. But there it is, half the book. Because that's where God is going to dwell among them. God is reestablishing his presence. Imagine Imagine Moses, the night before, I mean, the tabernacle's all done. They've spent time doing it all, getting it all set, and there it is. And I can just picture Moses, the Bible doesn't tell us this, just picture Moses gathering together the elders and the the heads of the people, and he says, "Do, do you know, do you know what this is, what this means? Tomorrow, tomorrow we begin the dedication of the tabernacle, and don't miss it. God himself is going to come and dwell among us. Not since Eden has God dwelt among his people. Tomorrow, God is going to come and dwell among us. 
And that's what happens. Exodus ends with God is there among them. And so by means of the covenant and relationship with Israel, God reestablishes his presence on earth. Time goes on, and it doesn't go well. We go through the centuries of the judges' period where they're oblivious to the presence of God, unfaithful to their God of the covenant. And we get to David and Solomon, and Solomon builds the temple, the temple which is transitioned from the tabernacle, a place for God's dwelling. And so we pick it up in Solomon's dedicatory prayer in 1 Kings 8. Praise be to the Lord who has given rest. <laughs> Look at that. Rest to his people. That's order. That's stability. That's security. It's not naps. He's given rest to his people Israel just as he promised. Not one word of all the good promises he gave through Moses has failed. And now look at verse 57. May the Lord our God, see it? Do you see it? Be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us or forsake us. The loss all over again. May he turn our hearts to him, to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, decrees, and laws he gave our ancestors. Relationship. Presence. Relationship. This is what God's doing all the way through the Bible. I'm not going to read these verses, but they go on to talk about how God is dwelling among them and for our hearts to be fully committed to him. Now, of course, we know the story how it goes. After the time of Solomon, the kingdom splits, and again, we find covenant unfaithfulness, and we find that they abuse the presence of God. Jeremiah yells at him for it in Jeremiah 7. You know, you come, the temple, the temple, the temple, and you trample all over it. Shut the doors. Well, somebody shut the doors so that all these people don't come trampling in my holy courts with all the wrong ideas. And so things go badly again. And we get to the end of that. The Babylonians come and Jerusalem under siege and we find that a first group goes into exile and among them is Ezekiel. And Ezekiel prophesying among the exiles he has a vision, chapter 10, and he sees the presence of God leaving the temple. Wheels within wheels, four living creatures. It's a really scary thing, right? The presence of God is leaving. That's the scary part. The loss. All over again. But even in that same prophet Ezekiel, after Jerusalem is destroyed, after the temple is destroyed, through Ezekiel, God says, but I'm going to bring restoration. In Ezekiel 34, we read, then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the Israelites, are my people. There's more coming. There's more coming. Now, even before the time of Ezekiel, we had heard from Isaiah, and Isaiah talked about a child to be born, and that child represented something very special. We know his name, Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? What does Emmanuel mean? I love this about Indonesia. You know Hebrew. Okay, anyway. Uh, yes, it's a Hebrew word. Emmanuel, God with us. You see now that that's not just something that's only about Jesus. It's not something that's just a Christmas story. It's not something that we sing in an occasional worship song. Emmanuel is what the whole thing is about. From day one of what God is doing, it's about Emmanuel, God dwelling among his people. God with us. 
And we can't make the mistake of the tower builders. It's not God with us so we can prosper. It's not God with us so he can do for us. It's not God with us so that he protects us and we feel nice and cozy in his love. It's not God with us for our agendas. That's what the tower builders were doing. They had the God with us idea as making their name great, and we sometimes make the same mistake. Emmanuel is not about us. It's about us buying into God's agenda. Sometimes I think that when we, when we think about encountering Christ, however and whenever you did it, we think about encountering Christ, and we think about, I'm kind of driving along the road of life in my luxury sedan, you know, going to my best life now, and there's Jesus at the side of the road. Hey, Jesus, open the passenger door. Come on in. You know, now that you're in my passenger seat, you can help me get to my best life now, and you can show me how I can succeed and be prosperous and everything will go well for me. Just, you know, be my GPS in life to help me get to where I want to go. That's a mistake because God is not with us to meet our agendas. And instead, what happens, we're driving along in our luxury sedan on the road of life, and we see Christ at the side of the road. We open the door. We say, come on in. He said, no, I don't think so. Um, why don't you just ditch that junker that you're driving that you seem to think is a luxury sedan? Just ditch it by the side of the road. It's not worth a whole lot anyway. And come on with me. Follow me. And he leads us to the station and get on the train of God's plans and purposes. You are part of the big things that God is doing. Hop on the train and participate. Leave your junker by the side of the road. Because we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. But it's Christ who lives in us. And so Emmanuel is not about us. Emmanuel is about God. So let's make the jump across into the New Testament. And it doesn't take us very long to encounter something, the very next important step. John 1.14, the Word became flesh, not brick and stone, not tents and gold statues. The Word became flesh and made its dwelling place, made his dwelling place among us. He became the tabernacle among us. He became the temple among us. The tabernacle, temple that held the presence of God. That's what the incarnation is about. And so he dwelt among us. This is a quantum leap. It's nothing that was ever anticipated in the Old Testament that God's next step in establishing his presence among his people would be through his son in the flesh, the incarnation. Too often we encounter the story of Christ and we're, we're rushing to the conclusion, the crucifixion where Jesus saves me, the resurrection where he gives me eternal life. I love it. It's all about me. And we can easily look past the incarnation, God with us. That's what Emmanuel theology is all about. When we get to the end of the story, I don't want to talk about the crucifixion and the resurrection as important as they are. I want to talk about the upper room because there Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going away. <laughs> They're staggered, grief-stricken, the loss all over again. What did we do? What can we do? And Jesus has two things to say to them that I want to point out. One, he says, but the comforter is coming. I'm going to send the comforter. And I can picture Peter leaning over to Andrew and saying, what in the world's a comforter? I've got no clue. I don't know. Well, maybe he'll tell us. We're always confused. Okay, so, but, but the comforter's coming. But then the second thing he says, don't fear, because I'm going 
to prepare a place for you. Not the first time he did that. That's the Genesis 1 story where he prepared a place for us. And the reason for Genesis 1 and John 14 is the same. So that where I am, you may also be. God dwelling among his people. Because that's why God created us. It's the story of the Bible. It's what God has always wanted. And he's been working at it since the beginning of history. To dwell among his people. And even as he spends those few moments with the disciples as he's ready to ascend into heaven after the resurrection. And we always remember that's when he gave them the great commission. Go and preach and tell. And we say, yes, 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 go, go, go. And then we miss the last line because we're already going, which is, not, you know. But we miss the last line. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And it's interesting to say I'm with you as he leaves. But of course, it's only scant weeks later as they're gathered in the upper room and they are uh, at the time of Pentecost. And what happens? We know the story. The tongues of fire descend upon them and the Holy Spirit inhabits them, comes to dwell in them. Talk about another quantum leap. Now not just God dwelling in their midst in a temple, not just God dwelling among them in Jesus, but now God dwelling within them. God's presence in his people. And so we hear as Peter addresses the crowd. Acts 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Of course, that's now the reconciliation that's available through Christ that allows them to be in the presence of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, this is about God establishing his name in us. It's not about us making a name. It's about him making a name in us. For the forgiveness of your sins, available in Christ to bring you relationship with God. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, presence of God in you. The promise, the covenant, which was aiming toward the establishment of the presence of God, the promises for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so we see that Pentecost leads us to this next important step. And so as a result, Paul tells us that we are the temple. We are the temple of the living God. And look at his quote. As God has said, I will live with them. And I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Presence, relationship. And so we find that at Pentecost, we reverse what happened at Babel. Babel, they wanted God's presence to come down and be among them, and God rejected that initiative. And here at Pentecost, God's presence descends and it comes into them. At Babel, their languages were scattered in confusion. And at Pentecost, everyone heard in their own language. And so the language was unified rather than scattered. And then as God's Spirit comes on all those who were baptized that day, they go scattering out to their own places around the world, not in failure and confusion like the tower builders, but rather with the presence of God going with them. To establish his name in the world through his church because it's about his name, not about our name. And that's where we are today, God's people, him dwelling in us, his presence in us, 
relationship provided by Christ so that we can be, have access to the Father, access to the presence of God, access, not denied, not lost, never lost again. But of course, that's not the end of the Bible's story. We have to turn over to Revelation chapter 21. I told you I'd get to Revelation. You didn't believe me. <laughs> Revelation 21. This is a description of new heavens and new earth. And look at how it starts. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's <laughs> dwelling place is now, finally, ultimately, absolutely among the people. And he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. You can't miss it, can you? But so often we do. Presence, relationship. This is why God created us. This is where the whole Bible is moving. It's the story of the Bible. And since God brings this particular result to pass, and since he started with this back in Genesis 1, we can see that this is what God has always wanted. What do we do with that? There's a story about a man called Brother Lawrence. He lived several centuries ago. He was a monk working in a monastery. And he got a little bit tired of the, the matins and vespers, you know, the morning prayers, the evening prayers that they did. It wasn't that they were wrong. It's just he felt like it wasn't, it wasn't getting him where he wanted to go. He somehow felt like those were brackets on the day. But the rest of the day, you know, he just didn't feel in touch with God. Maybe you feel that way yourself. Sometimes, even when you have your evening and morning times with God, it just feels like the day is, is isolated from that. And so he decided on a strategy. He decided that every hour, he would just kind of mentally pause. He would still keep doing the work he was required to do, but just mentally pause and think about the idea that God is dwelling in him, that he is the child of God and that he's in relationship with the living God. Just a, a moment of mental check, you know? And he would go on with his work. And that seemed to work pretty well for him, but he said, but it's still just not enough. And so he started to say, okay, every half hour, I'm just going to touch base, touch base, know where I am. And so he started doing that every half hour. And he was feeling more of the reality of the presence of God so he said, that's not enough. And so he began to do it every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes, every five minutes. Touching base with the realities of being in relationship with God and having God's presence in us. Clearing space in your mind, in your life, in your soul, in your day, clearing space for the presence of God. How would it change how you act during the day? How would it change the decisions that you make? How would it change the thoughts that go through your mind? How would it change the way that you treat other people if we practiced the presence of God. God wants us to recognize him. He doesn't want us just to show up to receive his gifts. Sometimes you hear about kids who come to resent their parents because they feel like their parents are simply giving them lots of stuff 
instead of spending time with them. That somehow the giving of gifts becomes the substitute for actually spending quality time. And they feel cheated because stuff is not enough. God doesn't make that mistake. His relationship with us is not just to give us gifts and ignore us. His relationship with us is all about being, working together in his plans and purposes. He wants us to participate in his plans and purposes. And we so easily neglect him. So let me end with a story. A number of years ago, I was invited to a conference, a fairly select, exclusive, invitation-only conference. And I was a little bit surprised that I got the invitation. It seemed like it was kind of above my pay grade. Um, but I was delighted about it and decided to go. And I went, and there were maybe 50 people attending. And as I kind of looked around, you know, just kind of opening reception, and I'm looking around at the name tags and just... My eyes are bugging out. Wow, wow, I should go and just sit in a corner and, and just be happy to watch because I can't believe that I'm among this elite group of people. And then I saw across the room somebody whose work I knew very well and a very prominent person, and, and I admired what they had done. I thought, they're here too. I wonder if I might get a chance to go up and shake their hand and introduce myself and then not know what to say and kind of slink off in embarrassment and, you know, I, right? And, and so I thought, maybe, maybe sometime during these couple days I, I can meet that person. They divided us into small groups for discussions, uh, and I was in a group with maybe 15 chairs in a circle, and this person was right across from me, you know, and I'm just... You know, uh, hardly paying attention to what's going on because I'm just so impressed uh, with this person being there. And again, I thought, okay, after this small group's over, I'm going to go over. I'm, no. I'm going to go. No. Uh, what will I do? I, I can go and shake their, you know, I don't know. I can't do it. I can't do it. <sighs> the small group ended. And next thing I know, this person just comes back bounding across the room toward me. No other way to describe it. Bounding across the room, grabs my hand, starts wringing it and shaking it and saying, I was hoping that I'd get to meet you. I've read your work. I know what you're doing. And, and I really have appreciation for it. I wonder if we can get a chance to sit down together and talk about it. And I said, well, I'm pretty busy. I'll get, why don't you get your people to contact my people and we'll see what we can. No, 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 no. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking, if he ever lets go of my hand, I'm never going to wash it again. <laughs> and every time I recall that incident, I feel rebuked in my spirit. Because the fact is, the creator God of the universe has come bounding across space and time not just to shake my hand, but to embrace me as his child. And to say, I wanted to get to know you. I, I see the work you're doing. I wonder if we could spend some time together. And too often, we're the I'm kind of busy response. You know, your people, my people. You know, the God of the cosmos is dwelling within you and wants to be in relationship with you. It's why he created us. It's what the Bible is all about. And it's what God has always, always,